Welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution in conjunction with the Royal Geographical Society, an interview with Dr. Bharat Pankania. I'm Dick Bateman of BRLSI. I'm convener for Geography and Adventure. And with me is Penny Tranter, and I am co-convener of Geography and Adventure at BRLSI. Hello Barrett, Hello. it's really nice to see you here today. We have seen you on television many, many times as an expert on coronavirus and COVID-19 issues. How did you get started on your long and distinguished academic and medical career? So thank you, uh, thank you for asking me. Uh, I have been a, a perpetual student most of my life. I trained as a general practitioner, then I did respiratory medicine, and then I saw the light and I realized preventative medicine was the way forward, so I went and did public health medicine. And then I diversified again and became a consultant in communicable disease control for over 20 years. And my expertise is in infectious disease control, outbreak management, and planning, emergency preparedness. So when the coronavirus COVID-19 disease started, I knew that this was a big problem. This was a big problem to be. And working at my new desk from University of Exeter Medical School, I could speak independently. And as a result of being able to speak independently and share the nuances of outbreak control, disease management, and uh, best strategies forward, uh, a lot of the media have been interested in my uh, input. And how did you get started on your very accomplished media career? I think it all started in Bath. Uh, I started writing for the Bath Chronicle and, and, and my writing was about this is a rising tide. I clearly remember I had returned home from a uh, holiday from India and it was about mid-January and I decided that uh, we need to talk about this. Mm. Uh, even if it doesn't spread around the world, we need to talk about it. And so I started to write and talk about it. The big issue is and was, and it still is, and it hasn't been properly addressed, is the emergence of new viruses, uh, man's incursions into the ecology of animals, and man's determination to make cheap food at any cost to planet Earth. That was my driving force. I felt, here we go again. So I have a lot of experience with pandemic influenza planning, uh, emergence of uh, uh, pandemic influenza viruses, and the clear line there is man's interference with making cheap food. And I felt, here we go again. We've had SARS and uh, we were lucky to get away with it. We've got MERS in the Middle East and what are we doing about preventative measures? So that's where I was coming from. Well, that's really interesting to hear because you talk about MERS and SARS and, and how it compares to COVID-19. I mean, what are the differences? You know, why has one become a, a, a sort of global horror story and the others are just kind of focused in one or two areas of the world? So SARS, we had a lucky break. SARS arrived in 2002-2003. It's a new virus, arrived out of the blue, and, you know, it was a zoonotic, meaning it was an animal virus, civet cats, in Guangdong province in China, and then it became a human virus, and it became transmissible amongst humans. The good luck that was on our side with SARS was that uh, it wasn't very infectious, point one. Point two, uh, when people get got infected, they also were infectious at the same... So they were symptomatic and infectious at the same time. And therefore, we could easily find the case when they became symptomatic and remove the case from circulation and remove their contacts from circulation. And as a result, we managed to conquer SARS. Whereas SARS-CoV-2, that's the name of the virus for COVID-19 disease, 
the people are often without symptoms, but they are infected and infectious. So we don't know who is infecting whom until we just get a case out of the blue. And that has made control that much more difficult. And also the SARS-CoV-2 virus is much more infectious. It's less pathogenic than SARS, meaning if you got SARS, the disease, there was a 10% chance you will die if you were ill with the disease. Whereas with SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19 disease, the chance of dying are across all age groups about 4%. So less pathogenic, but more infectious. Do we actually know how um, the coronavirus passed from animal to human? And yes. And where? So there is, a, we know a lot. And I, uh, so, the, so the summary is as follows. It is of bat origin, and the virus has gone from bats to an intermediate mammal. It could be a pangolin, it could be something else. It may not even be a mammal, we don't know. But it has gone through an intermediate host. And in that intermediate host, it has reasserted itself. And what I mean by that is it has elements of uh, the bat virus, it has elements of this other animal's coronavirus as well. And the two elements put together has gone on to make a third virus, uh, a coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 as we call it. And this new virus happens to be infectious to man, mankind. And it's obviously, as we now know, a pandemic strain. So it has arisen from bats, intermediate host reasserted itself with the intermediate host and jumped species to infect humans. What do you think of the idea that this vaccine might have been manufactured by the Chinese military in a lab somewhere in Wuhan? So virologists who look at the makeup of the genome, so we have this coronavirus CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, we look at its genome, we find no evidence that it has got what we would call artificial insertions in making this virus in a, what we would call a biosecurity lab. So I'd like uh, people to be reassured that this is a virus that has emerged as a result of reassortment. And we should not call it the China virus. It happened to originate in China but it could have anywhere where the environment is conducive to the emergence of new viruses. We need to focus our energies on prevention and stop those environments in which new viruses emerge. And a lot of it is to do with farming practices. It's wild animals, it's unusual animals, animals that are not normally found in nature, brought together forcefully for the purpose of trading and eating. And it is similar with also mass production of um, meat. So with respect to pandemic influenza viruses, it is the uh, bringing together of lots of pigs and lots of birds, chickens and humans all in together and you can get co-infections and reassortment and emergence of new viruses. What we should be focusing on, nevertheless, which is very important, is the emergence of new viruses. Why? What are the environmental conditions enabling the emergence of new viruses? And I have said repeatedly, spend millions in preventing the emergence of new viruses. So this would be background work that you would never hear about, not sexy enough. You don't want to invest. The consequences are you will spend trillions upon trillions upon trillions and devastate global economies because you didn't want to spend millions in preventative work. We need to readdress the way we live. We are forever focused on producing cheap food 
with no regard for ecology. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, for example, what are we doing? Harvesting bats and keeping bats who are stressed out with the coronavirus uh, in captivity next to another mammal or another animal that we don't know which one, also stressed out, freaked out, and then enabling that animal to be the reassorting agent. This is wrong. And similarly, we do the same with uh, seasonal influenza and pandemic influenza viruses. We have the environment whereby too many chickens, too many pigs in close proximity with wild birds coming and going, introducing a new virus which reassorts and emerges as a pandemic strain. One more issue, and this is all a trial run with SARS-CoV-2, antimicrobial resistance. It's a serious issue. We are feeding antibiotics to make cheap meat. It's ridiculous. People are feeding antibiotics as a feed to chickens and pigs to make them put on weight faster so that they can be taken to market sooner so that you can make your money faster and you introduce the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. This is serious. When you don't have antibiotics that work, you won't be able to treat your sore throat. You won't be able to do your hip transplants because you won't have the right antibiotics. It is very serious. And yet we are not paying enough attention to it. And importantly, how does coronavirus transmit from person to person? So we now have at least three modes of transmission. We have the heavy droplets, we have the contaminated surface, and then we have the smaller droplets, aerosol spread in a confined environment. And all the more reason for us to be extra cautious with issues such as ventilation, diluting the, um, the, the viral load by having fresh air coming, through a building, uh, workplace, that sort of situation. And of course, we also know that uh, the virus is present in feces. Um, we uh, therefore know that it can be transmitted through, you know, fomites, you know, handling your dirty hands, your dirty hands touch a surface, you touch a surface, you touch it, you introduce it to yourself. So without a doubt, we do know that uh, there is presence in human feces as well. And as we go into our um, new normal, what would be your advice um, in respect to the four top tips to help us keep ourselves safe? So my principles would be, um, how do you protect yourself? Well, first think about how the virus gets to you. So the virus gets to you via either the aerosol route in a confined, crowded building where there's poor ventilation and too many people. On the other hand, you may be on a crowded bus or a train where there's, again, too many people because the essence is human beings cause human infections. You're not going to get it from your dog, your cat, unlikely. So wherever there are too many human beings, there is a potential for infection. So what are the precautions you can take? The precautions are stay away from humans. This is, this is not possible. So what is the second layer of protection you can take? Which is whenever you are close to other human beings, you uh, take measures such as you could wear a face covering. So that way it is a case of I don't infect you and you don't infect me. It's not absolute, it's not 100% protection, but it goes some way towards reducing the viral load coming from somebody's mouth and hitting somebody else's face. Uh, there are other precautions you can take, of course, which is good hand hygiene. A lot of people, most people, don't know how to wash their hands properly. Uh, I have spent my life as an expert in communicable disease control and the easy bits are the ones that are never done properly because it's not sexy enough. 
If you were to just wash and dry your hands properly, we would get a lot fewer uh, viral infections, the noroviruses, the influenzas, the bacterial infections, including coronavirus, COVID-2. We talk a lot about wash your hands. There is a system to this. I would say you should wash your hands mindfully, not absent-mindedly. So whilst we've had um, government lines saying things like uh, sing happy birthday twice and wash your hands, that sort of thing, I would profoundly disagree with that. My reasons are, when you are sort of washing your hands and you're singing happy birthday, you are not mindful of it. Mm -hmm. So I would say be mindful. In other words, you focus, you concentrate, and you watch what you're doing. So you develop a system of washing your fingers in between your digits, up to your arm, the hair, all the surfaces in between, between your nails, underneath your nails, all around, everywhere. And then you rinse it off and then you dry your hands thoroughly. And then with that towel that you just dried your hands thoroughly, you switch the tap off and then still holding onto the towel, you touch the do toilet door handle or closet handle, you open it, you hold it open with your leg, you take the tissue paper, dispose it off in the dustbin, walk out, hands clean. You haven't touched any surfaces. And it's simple things like that which people don't do properly. Uh, that would be a good protective measure to take. One more final thing is look at the epidemiology of uh, the infection. So the epidemiology of the infection highlights for us the people who are more at risk of infection and severe disease. Who are these people? Well, the evidence is very clear. If you are over 60, your case fatality rate starts to creep up. In other words, by case fatality, we mean if you are infected and are ill with the infection, you're more likely to suffer a severe illness and about 3 to 4% of 60 to 70 year olds will die. About 8% of 70 to 80 year olds will die. And about 14% of over 80 year olds will die. So that's the step changes with older people. Who are these other people? The other people are men. Men are more susceptible to severe illness and fatality compared to women. Who else? People with coexisting medical conditions. What medical conditions? Diabetes, bl uh, blood pressure, heart disease. So if you have got coexisting medical conditions and you are in the older age group, or you've got coexisting conditions and not in the older age group, you are at risk. So you identify the at-risk people and you say, more at risk you need to be extra cautious and take extra precautions. Dr Pankhan here. When do you think live lectures may start? For instance, in the lovely Elwyn room at BRLSI and at the large theatres of uh, the Ge Royal Geographical Society. I have no hesitation in saying this and I regret to say it because it's a lovely place, it's a good social gathering. We network with fellow human beings, which is the thing that we humans are, have to do, and uh, it just isn't right at the moment. We have a virus in circulation. I am concerned about the autumn months because when the autumn months arrive, it's cooler, people are more indoors, we have a rise in temperature, a rise in uh, viral type infections, so I'm very concerned about the autumn months, and I would say as a good precaution, we ought not to have these lectures in the autumn 2020. Uh, one more thing, uh, when you have a at-risk population in an old building with poor ventilation, uh, again it poses a risk. Uh, you could have fewer people, but by having fewer people and a lecture, you lose the essence of the lecture. So the one way forward is do your lectures, continue with it via uh, the IT platforms of Zoom, Team or Skype or whatever medium that you can find. So now that we're going into the new normal and we're awaiting a vaccine to be developed 
from somewhere around the world. How do you think we can keep ourselves safe? So, whilst we have heard a lot about the development of vaccines, yeah, what we need to be aware of is this coronavirus is a complicated beast. It really is. The common cold virus is part of the coronavirus family. And as we all know, we get a, a, a common cold about every six months. Implication, we do not make good, strong immunity to a coronavirus infection. So in the midst of not making strong immunity, immune memory against coronavirus proteins, it's difficult to make a vaccine because a vaccine is essentially bits and pieces of the specific virus introduced into our cells by injection so that your body recognizes it and says, I know you, I have my beta cells armed against you. Should you arrive again, I'm going to mount a massive antibody response to you, attack you, neutralize you and eliminate you. So if we are not making that immune memory, to make a vaccine is difficult. So we shouldn't put all our eggs into, we're going to have a vaccine. One more thing, a bit of good news. We learn that on the other hand, the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 appears to make good cellular immunity. So what about cellular immunity? It implies, uh, let me talk about cellular immunity first. So compared to the antibody production, Cellular immunity is sluggish, it's slow, slow to respond, slow to act, slow to sort of get into action, but it is still there. So if you have cellular immunity, maybe, maybe just, the cellular immunity eventually kicks in and starts to fight the virus off. And therefore, hopefully, hopefully, it, it doesn't give you such a severe second infection. That is the hope. Only time will tell. But the positive news is, at least we know that SARS-CoV-2 does induce cellular immunity. It does produce antibodies. Of course it does. What we don't know is, do these antibodies last a long time? And will they be persistent beyond 6 months, 12 months, 18 months? We don't know. How do you think the new normal will look for us? here in the UK? So the new normal that people are talking about is, again, be aware of the science. And when you are aware of the science and you understand the basic fundamentals, the epidemiology, as I say, you will know what your new normal is. So it's also a case of horses for courses. So if you are a predominantly young family, fit and healthy, then the precautions for yourselves are pretty minimal. You don't want to get infected, without a doubt, uh, but you are not under heightened anxiety or uh, caution. On the other hand, if you have got elderly people in the house, people over 60, people with diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, etc., you need to exercise care and caution. So what is the new normal going to look like? I think the new normal is going to look like People who are at risk taking extra precautions not to get infected. The rest of the people, they, I think they will drop their guard. But what I would advise is if you are in the vulnerable group, don't drop your guard. For goodness sake, don't do it. So always rehearse, repeat, reinforce and be aware that you are in the at-risk group. What's going to happen is... Uh, the people who are not in the at-risk group will behave as they wish. But you, the person in the at-risk group, take precautions to protect yourself because only you can protect yourself. And that is very strong advice for people returning back to work because there will be generic advice for people going back to work and other things. And my advice is, does this advice fit with your health needs? and the needs of your family and work it out and make your assessment 
yourself. That's very important. And how far do you feel the medical information given to the public might have been influenced by political considerations? So what we have noticed uh, throughout the uh, operations for this pandemic in the United Kingdom is that the information has not been voluminous, it has not been timely, and it hasn't been succinct. And this is very unfortunate. I say it's unfortunate because the United Kingdom is a first world country. It has very clever scientists, experts, and considering we have such a large armamentum of uh, expertise, we are not behaving in an expert manner. What we should have had, really, is uh, perhaps a neutral body of outbreak specialists leading on this and just delivering the we are where we are situation, rather than it being uh, a mixed platform of politicians and scientists all on the one platform and one is constrained by the other in being free and frank and being able to communicate those very, very important messages. I think it is unfortunate because we need to take the public with us. We mustn't lose their trust. And I think uh, I'm, a, I'm a veteran of uh, outbreaks and major incidents. So I remember when uh, the Health Protection Agency was created and we had Pat Troop. She was a practitioner in our, my, my, uh, my art and craft and science, um, Pat Troop would lead on the conference about, for example, polonium-210, the incident that we had. And it really was the science taking the lead, and it was said as is. Um, we need that sort of uh, platform for the scientists to individually say it as it is, rather than share that platform and everyone is therefore constrained because headmaster is watching. And what are you recommending for the long term? For the long term, we need to not work in our silo. This is very important. I notice the United Kingdom wishes to go it alone on everything because it has left the European Union. It wishes to have its own satellite system, its own scientific bases, its own vaccine program, its own, own, own. On global Earth, we cannot live in a silo on our own. We need to work with partners internationally. So on the subject of preventative measures, we have the WHO, World Health Organization, at this very critical time. We need to support the WHO because whilst you are fighting the infection in your country, failure to fight the infection in the poorer countries equals an amplification of the number of cases in the poorer countries. So we have already seen large number of cases in Brazil, in India. We will have cases in Indonesia, Malaysia, Africa. When you have that amplification of a number of cases, several things happen. One of them is um, you curtail it in your country, but it gets reintroduced. It keeps on getting reintroduced from all those other nations. Secondly, it becomes an endemic strain. And what I mean by an endemic strain, and I think, and I'm saying it to you on record, that I think the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, is going to become an endemic virus for planet Earth. What I mean by that is it remains ever persistent. We never fully eliminate it. And it's always there. So it's always going to reappear and cause outbreaks. Uh, but really, going forward, my sincere wish and advice to anyone listening is work collectively, support international organizations like the WHO, fund them properly to do their work globally for the best of mankind. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Bharat Pankania. Yes, thank you very much indeed for joining us today and sharing all your expert knowledge about the current situation. You're very welcome. Thank you.